I mean, there is a, a burgeoning field of neuroethics which takes some of these developments in the neurosciences, extrapolates from them way, way, way down the line to situations that are currently inconceivable in the, in the science, and then asks what are, what are the implications going to be. And I think a lot of the debate here about the loss of free will and the loss of responsibility and the moral questions which are posed by that are more science fiction than they are science fact. Um, there are real implications, which if we had time we could go into, about the, the, the development of neuroscience and its impact on the criminal justice system, but I don't think they're going to be about doing away with free will and responsibility. After all, it's only 50 or 60 years ago that people thought that psychology, and perhaps even whisper it not allowed, psychoanalysis held the key to understanding why people acted. And there were big movements to say psychoanalysis is going to transform the whole system of criminal justice. Actually, the system of criminal justice, ideas of morality, ideas of free will, ideas of responsibility, has, have withstood all those assaults by the positive sciences for reasons that they operate at a different level. We have, for various reasons that we could discuss, we have to hold people culpable. We're the kinds of persons that ascribe responsibility to others, whatever the science says. Those are cultural facts, they're social facts, they're political facts, and whatever we discover in the neurosciences, I don't think it's going to transform that radically. I yeah, let me go, here, right. and then I'll come right back. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I, I think that's basically right, and I think the reason is that, and I think it is also something that uh, people who study jurisprudence do understand and that the criminal justice system, although sometimes we clothe it in a certain very abstract and shall I say romantic way, ultimately really is there to serve public safety. And issues of public safety and deterring antisocial behavior are really the fundamental factors that play the most important role in, in the criminal justice system, having the character and, and the color that it actually does. Within that, of course, we debate back and forth about how to deal with certain kinds of situations. But even where we know, for example, with um, humans who have a genetic variant called the MAOA variant, where if they're also abused as children, they're very, very likely to grow up to be violent and, and very destructive. The criminal justice system is very unlikely to say about those people, well, it's not their fault, they didn't choose to be MAOA variants, they didn't choose to be abused as children, so we'll just pat them on the head and let them go. And the reason we don't do that is because these are very, very dangerous individuals. They're very harmful and they hurt other people essentially for no, no reason. So I think when we have that very pragmatic take on the criminal justice system, which incidentally the great American philosopher John Dewey had, I think it gives us a much more grounded perception of the nature of responsibility and the social role that it plays in impulse control in self-discipline and in modifying behavior so that we can, at least in a minimal sense, um, get along. Okay, let me go here, Francis and Paul, and, and, and... I want to strongly in, in agree with what uh, Nick said, that even though we are learning things about behavior that are perhaps genetically influenced, we're really talking here, aren't we, about genetic determinism and the risks of going down that road in terms of taking away individual responsibility. The data will not support that. Even in the MAO example that Pat just cited, the individuals with the high-risk allele who had child abuse, most of them didn't get into trouble with the law. It's just their risk went up substantially compared to those who didn't. And looking at this panel, I can tell you, because I'm a very sophisticated geneticist, that 10 out of the 12 people on this panel are about six times more likely to end up in trouble with the law than the other two. <laughs> and that's a genetic fact, and that's because they have a Y chromosome. And we have not... <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's true. And that is not, as far as I can tell, ever been considered as an excuse for breaking into the 7-Eleven. It's, it's <laughs> and anything we discover on top of that is probably going to be quantitatively a lot less important than that one factor. All right, let me go to the other end, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if we're quite taking this um, problem quite as seriously as we should. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I think pragmatically, of course, everything we've just 
heard over here is correct. Of course we have to behave as if we have free will. That's the only way we can have an open society. Of course, pragmatically, we have to have a criminal justice system in the way you describe. But let's now just think, if we take one of the aspects of being human, which of course is rational thought and understanding um, the world in a rational way, what is central to that is causal relationships. This is an argument from Kant. I mean, it's a very old argument. What comes from causal relationships? What emerges from that is not simply genetic determinism, but genetics combined with environment to generate what we are. Now, let's just push that to the extreme. If that's really true, and we are the consequence of our genetics and our environmental influences up to that point, explain to me exactly where the free will comes from. We've said that it's very straightforward, but where does it come from? Daniel, you were saying... Yes, yes, I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I've, that's a topic I've written several books on, so I'm lo but the hard thing is to, is, to, is to pare it down to a few seconds. Um, okay. The free will that matters, that you've actually drawn, drawn attention to, is, as I said in my opening statement, the capacity to be moved by reasons. Now, a system can be moved by reasons even though it's a deterministic system. It can be determined to be moved by reasons. You can have two systems, one of which is much better at being moved by reasons than another. They both can be deterministic. One of them is so good at being moved by reasons that we hold that system responsible. This other one is so bad at being more, uh, moved by reasons that we say this person has diminished responsibility. It has nothing to do with quantum physics or indeterminism. But re if your reason is determined, that is, by your genes and environment and everything that came up to that, where is your free will? Well, if your reason is determined and you are well designed as a being moved by reasons, then your reason will be determined by the best reasons that are around. And that's just what you want. I mean, <laughs> Lord knows I want, when I decide whether or not I'm going to pull the trigger or rob that man, I want the best reasons available to determine what I do. The last thing I want is for some quantum leap to suddenly <laughs> make me shoot, the, shoot, pull the trigger. All I'm saying is that maybe those best reasons you have no alternative but to come to those reasons. Well, <clears throat> in a certain sense, that's always going to be true. Why that's it? why it's so important that we do our best to get the right reasons out there in the world where people know them. That's why we make sure that people know the law. It's why pe we take steps to get, make sure people know the consequences of their acts in general. So, and of course, come right back. in the instant, in the moment, they are, of course, uh, completely bound by the causes that impinge on them at that time. But if we organize the environment right, then this will be a happy situation because they will be completely determined by the circumstances around them to do Ian. the right thing. 